The following program is made possible by Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo, the next stage. The campaign, well, it's never really over, is it? We're talking politics now and always with our dynamic duo of Marinucci and Whalen. The game is politics and the game is on. After a tough campaign, the president has been re-elected by a healthy margin. The Republicans are still in control of the House, and we seem to be right back where we started. We survey the landscape with our two political experts, Carla Marinucci, political writer for the San Francisco Chronicle, and Bill Whalen, research fellow at the Hoover Institution, and more recently, a continuing commentator for the Sacramento Bee. Welcome back to the game. It's great to have <laughs> you guys here. here. Uh, it's been a while since we've had a chance to have the two of you on. Uh, Real quickly, is there any sort of a mandate, any sort of message out of uh, the president's re-election? He won uh, by a fairly substantial margin, especially if you look at the Electoral College. Bill? Uh, the voters, in their infinite wisdom, uh, said that they want things changed in Washington, and they uh, want a discontinuation of bad politics, and so what did they do? They sent the same cast of characters back to Washington. <laughs> <laughs> Um, That's the way you see it, of course. Yeah, no, it's, um, look, in theory, the wind is behind the president yeah. um, in that he did uh, receive a, uh, a larger than expected turnout in popular vote and electoral votes. Uh, but that said, the public did put the brake on it by dividing the Congress neatly into half, which is just the perfect prescription for jamming things in Washington. Um, and it begs this interesting question, does Washington intend to govern or does Washington intend to campaign? We sit here now counting down toward the sequestration. Uh, as Phil Graham was famously said, a bad idea whose time has come. <laughs> um, but it does raise a serious question. Does the president want to bring Congress in and actually solve problems? Does the president see this as an opportunity to score points? By the same token, do Republicans in Congress see this as an opportunity to work with the president, or do they too want to score points? And sadly, both sides seem more interested right now in scoring points. Yes. Well, and the president in particular seems to be taking a very hard line. And, and I don't know how much of that is he's emboldened by his own uh, re-election or, or his poll polls, numbers. Mark, when you look at these polls, look, the Pew poll this week uh, showing 22 percent of uh, Americans uh, identify with the Republican Party uh, it went on issues like gun control, uh, climate change, immigration. He's got three quarters of Americans behind him. He's got a majority of Republicans behind him on the issue of uh, the, the sequestration and the budget cuts. Uh, at this point, you know, Obama laid it out uh, in the State of the Union and from the very start immigration, gun control, climate change, and, and uh, the whole fiscal issue. That's what he's going on, and he's it right now, it looks like, in the catbird seat. The, the whole sequestration thing is looking like uh, Game of Thrones with all the good stuff in it. These people are, are constantly trying to, uh, on both sides, uh, trying to uh, cut each other's heads off, and the public is sitting back and watching and saying, uh, you know, what's gonna happen? But the fact is, it does look like the president uh, has the edge. Well, the president has an edge because these are popularity contests, and it is a contest between an individual, the president of the United States, versus an institution, which is the Republican House. The president's always going to win that, and that leads you to believe that the battles of 2013 are really about the battles of 20 and 14. And if you're Barack Obama, what you have entertaining in the back of your mind is, if I can continue to paint the Republicans as the bad guys on these issues, be it guns, be it immigration, be it global warming, take your pick, I will get the House back in 2014. If I can hold on to the Senate, then I'm business for the last two years, my president. One of the things you got to love about politics, it's a word like sequestration, which, which none of us could even spell uh, a year ago, and now we're all, yeah, yeah. the we're trip's off the around. tongue so uh, right. liltingly. But it, it, to, to your point, the response of the Republicans has been to take their own hard line. Right. Uh, they seem to think that the, the deficit issue is their winning issue, and they're going to stay on it, it looks like. But Everything is, seems to indicate that we're heading towards the kind of calamity that happened in the government shutdown in the Clinton-Gingrich confrontation. And who's going to get blamed, as in that one, 
uh, when uh, when you you start getting the delays at the airport, uh, jobs start getting cut. Right. Uh, the president can point right over there, the other side yeah, of the that's, aisle. That's a problem they face right now. There's there's the politics of the now versus the politics of the long term. The media of the now versus the media of the long term. The media of the now is going to focus on cuts to the park service and all the horrifics that the president can light up on a daily basis. But the big picture is this: you're talking about three pennies on the dollar in sequestration. That's what it amounts to over a ten-year period. Three cents out of the entire federal budget. The United States government cannot come together, Congress, the White House cannot come together and figure out how to solve three cents on the dollar. How do they ever get our debt under control? Well, and that's the question. The gridlock is the other word you hear all the time, and it doesn't seem to be getting any better, although there's clearly a growing impatience among people, the people, the, you know, the American yeah. people, yeah. with the inactivity, inaction of the federal government. Why can't they get the message? Is it because we, we send people from such disparate parts of the country politically and philosophically and expect them to work together? Or is there an unwillingness to work together that might have been, you know, there might have been a willingness to work together a generation ago? Is the situation just all changed, Carla? I mean, I still think um, uh, among the Republican leadership, there is a fear of these Tea Party conservatives out there, the folks from the conservative districts who do not want to go for that uh, more centrist, even Boehner, uh, you know, has uh, is, is tried to push it. And uh, I think this, uh, how, when is this going to end? Well, well, the problem, well, well, this, 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 way, this, this, is compromise considered betrayal? No, but this is a two-party problem. You can't just lay this all on John Boehner. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Let's take, for example, Dianne Feinstein here in California, who has proposed an assault, an assault weapons ban. That is going nowhere fast in the United States Senate. Why? Because yes. there are seven Democrats in the Senate who are for re-election in 2014 who want nothing to do with this because yes. they come from yes. red states. Yes. Yes. So yes. it's I think I think there is a problem here in that Congress is just chock full of members of both parties who think short term and think their own political interests. So they're not it's, willing, it's, it's all about the next yeah. election. They're not willing to pardon the pun, take yeah. the bullet. Yeah. Yeah. Now, why would that be? I mean, we, we complain all the time in California that term limits has created an environment where there's such short term thinking. But you would assume most of these guys uh, are in the position to think long term because they're not automatically out of office. Politics, or is moves, well, politics moves quicker. It's more rough and tumble. If, you, uh, if you're a red state senator, let's say, a Democratic senator, and you decide to go for the assault weapons ban, you're immediately attacked on Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, your opponent's going to go out and raise a lot of money against you right away from the NRA. You're in trouble, and so you're probably just unwilling to walk the game. Uh, so a safe seat think, isn't as safe as it used to yeah, be. Yeah, and right, I think exactly. those hit on something. The social media environment has really changed. Uh, a lot of these these politicians are terrified of the Twitter effect, the YouTube effect. They they are unwilling to take uh, bold stands on anything because they know they're going to be uh, you know it, it, it's yeah, it's going to be but, out there. But among the effect. electorate, there's still in theory a large group of people who identify more with the middle than with either side of the extreme. Are those people just you know, is compromise dead? Is, is, is are those people just simply not significant players in the political environment anymore? And it's all about who's going to hit you on the extremes. Because when you're talking about this Twitter stuff, for example, yes. it's it's people who are Tea Party or who are extremely on the left, and those are the ones going after you. Uh, but the question is. Well, Isn't there a large block in the middle you can count on? There may be a block of voters in the middle, but the problem is the political system is not producing candidates in the middle. Uh, here in California, we've taken steps to address this. We have an open primary now, which in theory is going to produce more right. moderate candidates. We'll see if that takes hold. But look, here we are in the Bay Area. Uh, National Journal just ranked members of Congress for most conservative, most liberal. Five of the 18 most liberal members of the House are here in the Bay Area. They're all reelected by a very wide margins. That's what the locals prefer her. Mm -hmm. You go to other states, Alabama, have Minnesota, been, Minnesota, Have you seen, you know, Pete Stark was one of the most popular, one of the most liberal. Yeah. Uh, he went down last year. So, yeah. uh, I, you know, I think there are moderate politicians. Chris Christie with a 76% approval rating shown it can be done. Michael Bloomberg. Um, okay. But again, the nature of politics, Chris Christie comes out here to raise money at Mark Zuckerberg's house, and you have a hearty band of protesters. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Yeah, that we believe there. that he I is not it. a moderate. <laughs> We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Stay with us. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo First opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support, and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage.
Welcome back to the game. I'm Mark Simon. We're talking politics with Bill Whalen from the Hoover Institution and the Sacramento Bee and Carla Marinucci from the San Francisco Chronicle. <laughs> uh, we we got to pick up the conversation we're having off the air because we're talking about a moderate candidate. You mentioned Chris Christie. Is he too fat to be president? <laughs> <laughs> Checking to see if people living. You can't be too fat to be a journalist. That's the different issue. That's right. Can't be too fat or too good looking. Uh, I think that is in the eye of the individual voter. There are people, uh, and it's a very mixed bag. We were talking about this. Mike Huckabee. Uh, when he first ran for president, came out here to California, I remember, and did what? He did a book tour, and the book tour is about how he used to be very overweight, I think close to 300 pounds, and he was diagnosed with diabetes and lost 120 pounds and took control of his life. Christie, on the other hand, clearly could stand to lose weight, uh, but there is a school of thought. America is becoming heavier. People are more comfortable with the heavy image. Uh, but again, I think it's up to individual voters. But to Christie is is huge. I mean, let's be honest. And uh, that, uh, as you, you said, him at the, I've, at yeah, the that's, Zuckerberg that's event. That's right. And, and he's got, you know, I think the Zuckerberg event which had a, a crowd of very uh, lively protesters out front, also sort of underscores another problem that he's got. He is a moderate Republican, but he's done things like cut Planned Parenthood funding repeatedly or vetoed a, a gay marriage, a same-sex marriage repeatedly. And the, already uh, some of these groups are out there trying to define him as just another one of those, uh, you know, uh, Republicans on social issues. Mm -hmm. and. You know, we'll see how he handles that too, because on on women's issues, you remember the women's vote. Uh, that was a key factor for uh, Obama. And if Christie can't get off of that whole issue, I, I see you don't buy that. I think, I think Nelson Rockefeller, one of the most moderate Republicans of all time, would come to San Francisco, and he'd probably be heckled for being too rich. So <laughs> this is, George Bush put it best. He, he does. He asked why he doesn't come to San Francisco. He said because I came to San Francisco and walked on water. The headline of the paper the next year say Bush can't swim. Yeah. On the <laughs> other hand, Silicon Valley is is not uncomfortable with rich people. No, in, in a lot, by the way, a lot of very big Democratic Obama voters turned out right. to uh, donate that $3,800 to the Zuckerberg. Right, to it just made a lot of them maybe to just get inside right. Zuckerberg's the, house and say, issue, I was there. The weight issue with Christie raises a, a, another big question, another weighty question, and that's exactly what voters would be looking for in uh, 2016. If you argue it's the George Costanza theory of politics, and always <laughs> go with the opposite, uh, you go from the very sp thin, svelte, uh, uh, polite, you know, friendly Barack Obama to the overweight and <laughs> That's right. Crusty and, you know, well, a baseball metaphor that whatever manager they hire, it's the direct opposite of the exactly, one they had yeah. before. Um, <laughs> we were talking about the, the, the gridlock. How much is the news media contributing to it? Oh, not it, at it's, all. Especially, <laughs> especially yeah, in this, yeah, this yeah. country. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> well, with, the, with, the, course, with the exception of these fine <laughs> yeah, correspondents. But, right. but this, this tendency to give equal weight to both sides. It's true there's two sides to every story, but sometimes those sides are right and wrong. And, and yet when you have a debate in which you're trying to figure out, is this the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do, you have, here's what one side said, here's what the other right. side said, we're done, we're being fair and balanced. It's that and, and, and I think the tendency to get distracted by, um, can I say BS on the air? I mean, cable. Like, let's, I mean, go look, Nonsense. Water, the Marco Rubio water bottle was a perfect example of what we're talking about. I was guilty on that one. I tweeted, tweeted that one myself. And, and look, how much is that really an issue uh, when, when we're talking about somebody who was giving a substantive response to the president? Now, now that's out in the ozone. Nobody remembers what he said. We're, it's like we have ADD a lot of times in the media, and we're just um, looking for the next sort of big hit. And you're, you're absolutely right. Who's, who's actually analyzing the issues? Um, I think that that's, uh, that's, a, that's a real problem. I was looking to, for my water. I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> uh, it is, but you know, the sequestration does point this out in that the media are fascinated all times with the president's human props. You know, the children are going to starve in the streets and the senior citizens going to go without their benefits and so forth, rather than doing the more thoughtful approach, which is the walk up to how do we get in this situation in the first place. And how do we get out of it? And how do we it get reminds out of me it? of the, uh, the governor's uh, State of the State speech, which was focused on his literary illusions and his unique ability to quote a wide range of things from the little engine that could to, to Yates. Yeah. But, but, again, but, again, but it didn't go, talk yeah. about what he was really saying. But again, let's go back to the citizen and the voters' habits. Where do people get their information now? I'm sorry to say, but is it the morning newspaper? No. Well, they're, certainly they're, I do. But certainly you do. Carl <laughs> works for the Chronicle. No, but what do they do? If they're not turning on their television, they're looking on their app, they're looking on their phone, they're looking on their iPad, and they're seeing what's breaking news, they're seeing what's on drudge and so forth. And so they get caught up in the here and the now. They're not taking the time to sit down and read the more reflective stuff. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about... Um, the next big issues. 
we're going we're gonna to have sequestration. It's going to come. It's going to go. It'll be the crisis of the moment. Right. Uh, are there issues in the offing that could further exacerbate the whole gridlock? Or are there issues coming up that are really going to become turnkey political issues? Is immigration one of those? Mm -hmm. is, is the issue of abortion, which is likely to come to a head in the Supreme Court? Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think is on, on the horizon next in terms of the next big issues? Well, you know, we, we talked about Chris Christie and a little bit, and, and we were talking about this. I think uh, when you're talking about social issues, and we're going to see it here in California because we have the California Republican Party meeting uh, this month in Sacramento. These social issues are, uh, are a real uh, problem for, for for Republicans, look in Indiana. You had, uh, you know, this is getting huge sort of play among women uh, journalists. The the move by the Indiana Republicans to um, mandate not one but two transvaginal ultrasounds uh, for pregnant women. That's the kind of social issue that resonates with women voters. And uh, you know, I know the, these are we're a long way from the next election. But if you know, you start defining Republicans there, I think that's that kind of social issue is issue, a Could problem a for them. Issue. This issue of same-sex marriage is going to be uh, dealt with in the courts, and I think that's another one where we've seen a real shift on uh, polls. And uh, I, more and more Republicans, I think uh, John Huntsman this week also came out uh, for same-sex marriage. More and more Republicans are saying, why are we is going there? Republican? Let's just, uh, yeah. yeah under the category, <laughs> who really cares what he thinks? Yeah. Uh, seriously, John Huntsman, come on. Yeah. I, think, I think the story of Washington 2013 is that for all the emotional drama put into gun control, for immigration and, reform and so forth, will you really see anything by the end of 2013? You might see a few items on gun control uh, done. Immigration, I don't know. I thought, I would have said a month ago with a lot of confidence, immigration will be done. Why? Um, because there was a group in the Senate already moving on it. Um, Republicans looking toward 2016 I think saw the, the opportunity. I Dream Act you'll see something on. You're seeing enough of these kids coming forward I uh, don't with know. stories the problem, that I think. The problem, yeah, the problem though, is the president is sticking his craw into it where he shouldn't and that the White House report plan gets released and so forth. And this is the case where the president needs to very quietly behind the scenes let the Senate and the Congress take their action. Let me cut you off there. we got to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Stay with us. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo First opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Welcome back to The Game. I'm Mark Simon here with Bill Whalen and Carla Marinucci. Uh, you should hear the off-camera conversations. They're just <laughs> as good. Um, I, I don't want to spend too much time, more time on immigration, but we did talk about, Bill, you touched briefly off the air about the economic versus uh, the, the almost sort of quasi-political or social element of it. Well, the reason why it's a Gordian knot of politics is because, why? Well, if you talk about immigration here in Silicon Valley, uh, you're talking about H-1B visas, you're talking about engineers and tech jobs. Uh, if you go next door to Nevada, you're talking about kids growing up in the DREAM Act and when they actually you know, get legal status and, right. and so forth. You go elsewhere in the country, it gets to the rather uncomfortable issue of when you know, give somebody citizenship and therefore let them vote. All these different moving parts that have to come into one package. That's why, again, I suggest the White House, this is one where, yes, the White House probably feels internal pressure to, to show that it's involved because why the president's been on the record time and again talking about this, but the White House really has to let Congress work the situation out. Yeah. Let's talk about 2014. Um, one of the issues I know you're paying close attention to, one of the races, yeah. is a potential challenge in the Democratic primary to uh, Mike Honda, Congressman Mike Honda. Yeah, I think it's a, a fascinating if it happens. Um, you know, uh, Honda, a uh, six-term congressman, 71 years old, uh, has big support in the uh, Asian Pacific Islander community. Uh, but we could see a real top two primary battle here. Uh, Ro Khanna, who's an Indian American, Harvard educated, uh, Obama trade specialist, big support in Silicon Valley. And now his district uh, here, the 17th, has been recut to uh, now, you know, encompass the largest Indian American community in the United States, the second biggest manufacturing base in the United States, believe it or not. And uh, these are exactly in uh, Mr. Khanna's wheelhouse if he decides to go for it. I, I think it, it sets up a generational battle. It sets up an Asian versus Asian battle. And that makes it interesting because 
Indian Americans, a rising group. This is a, a group with cl political clout now. We're seeing more of that with Kamala Harris, with Bobby Jindal, with Ami Berra's election uh, up by Sacramento, and a rising economic clout. And in the tech community, uh, the Indian American community uh, is, has a very big presence uh, in Silicon Valley. Uh, some of the major venture capitalists, Vinod Khosla and others, are, are with Ro Khanna. Uh, if, if he decides to run, that's going to be a waste to watch. Jerry Brown decides to run for re-election. He'll be 70, let's see, 76 years old, I believe. Dianne Feinstein just re-elected, turns 80 this year. 71 is the new 50 in California Democratic <laughs> politics. <laughs> Although, I want to talk a little bit about the, the emergence of the Indian American community. Right. There's always, when a new group really gets involved in politics, there's always a, like one watershed election mm -hmm. where they really begin to understand their ability to coalesce financially yes. and as a voting block. In, in this Ro Khanna, Mike Honda race could be that place where they really begin to understand the ability they have to dominate a political landscape. That could be, and another one to look at would be 2016 of Bobby Jindal, mm -hmm. the governor of Louisiana, and first nation's first Indian American governor if he decides to run too. If he decides to run, I bet he'll be on a plane to San Jose very fast. Yeah. yeah. Any other races you two were watching in 2014? Chris Christie's up for re-election? Uh, Christie's up for re-election actually this fall. Oh, that's uh, right. This fall. And that's right. Jersey can't do yeah, it like yeah, everybody no, else can. The two elections this fall are fascinating because Christie, I think, is going to sail to re-election. He's going to yeah. get built up by the press as the model for Republicans. The moment he runs for president, the press will start tearing him down. Uh, but then you have... You know, <laughs> forgetting that you're one of us now. Right? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Wait a minute. Yeah. You're part of the liberal <laughs> media elite. How, how sad for you. <laughs> uh, but the other election to watch will be in Virginia, where you have the Attorney General Ken Cuccinelli against Terry McAuliffe, the former that's Democratic National Committee yeah. chairman. And that is just going to be... Uh, uh, hammer and tongs, itchy and scratchy politics at its worst <laughs> in terms of throwing everything at each other. Uh, in 2014, the action is going to be both the House trying to hold on, but then also these seven red state Democrats up and one yeah. of the Republicans. Yeah. And, here, the Democrats here, have the and here's the point I have to say the Republicans have nothing, no game whatsoever in California uh, for, for the, the statewide offices. State state right. offices yeah. And Jerry Brown. I Actually, yeah, in fact, the game in California 2014 will be a ballot initiative if it gets out of Sacramento, which will change the initiative process, which will give the legislature the ability to undo past initiatives. And, and further denude the Republican Party of any influence. And pretty much make the Sacramento Republican lawmaker a thing of the past. Yeah. yeah. Did the Democrats have a shot at retaking the House in 2014? Uh, yeah. Probably. Hey. Uh, historically, you'd say no. It's the midterm, second yeah. term for and president. And the gerrymandered districts, which gave the gerrymandered time. Of size, I just think Nancy Pelosi, the most effective campaign in America to me is, again, just saying Speaker Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, that, but that would, would, I imagine, is why she's, she's That's staying. That's why she's hanging around. The expectation yeah. was that she might have dropped out so, this time. So if they don't yeah. take it in 2014, I wouldn't be surprised yeah, if she... Yeah, a lot of people su suggest that she'll she... She'll still be in her 70s, which, again, it's a new 50 in California <laughs> politics. There you go. <laughs> it's kind of like um, hope they rarely retire. So. And, and then squinting ahead to 2016, um, everybody made a big flurry over uh, Secretary of State Clinton as she stepped down. Said so she's tired and wants to rest, um, but I don't think anybody believes she's so tired she can't recuperate enough to run. You know, she has a play. lot of friends in California, the Clintons do, uh, and I've heard two uh, very different stories here in Silicon Valley. Half the people saying, Clinton, are you kidding? Bill Clinton, everybody loves it. No problem, that's it. And then the other side saying, oh, no, she's too old, uh, too 20th century, we need a new. Uh, it's going to be interesting to watch. Here in California, which is the ATM, and, and Clinton has such long-time ties here. He was laying the ground, the, physically laying the wires for the Internet here back in, what, then again, 1990? Then again, if we want to look at what a computer looked like in the 1990s. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, the interesting thing about the Hillary, there are two things about Hillary which I find interesting. One is she'll be 69 years old. In 2016, but 70 is the new 50, so what? Only she wants California. to run in California. That's <laughs> wonderful. But historically, Democrats usually nominate people in their 40s and 50s. She might be, I hate to say, a little too old. But secondly, it's her relationship and Bill Clinton's within the Democratic Party, which, as we saw in 2008, is fragile. Democrats have fond feelings about the Clintons, but they're not in love with the Clintons necessarily. So but I in think in 2012 they were in love with Bill Clinton. I, anyway, but they, they weren't they voting. Just, but they weren't voting for yeah, Bill Clinton. Yeah, There's a difference. Yeah. So I think the opportunity is there actually for a Democratic governor, uh, if such a creature exists, to actually to run as the outsider. <laughs> not many of them do. Right. So, so, so quickly, who on the Democratic side 
fits that formula, 40s, 50s, somebody we should be watching? Andrew Cuomo? I would say John Hickenlooper, the uh, governor of Colorado, is one to watch. On the Republican side, uh, I think you just might as well run the Republican names as credit because it is many to go into this time. Christy, though, is at the head of the list if he gets reelected. You got Christy, you got Rubio, you got Bobby Jindal. Paul Ryan, Paul Ryan. Uh, several others. Uh, Eric John Kasich, Kasich, Scott Walker, just the list yeah. goes on. Yeah. yeah. And, and does the politics get better or does it get worse? Does it get more? Of, we got more of the same in the last election. Do we get more, more of the same? The Republicans, the problem with Republicans is they have a lot of uh, potentially very good candidates, but they have such a rotten selection process where you have to go through these very, those very endless bad... Endless debates. Endless debates, you know, 20 debates, these horrible litmus tests in these very small states which skew too far to the right. They have to reform the way they take Their main issues, they have to come up with that coalition that Obama yeah. won. Uh, African Americans, Latinos, women, young people, that they outweighed white right. men. Right. So they have to Sorry, chip guys. away at that. Yeah, yeah, they and, have to chip away. And they, they have to find a way to appeal more broadly. The problem is the process pushes them to the right, and then an awful lot of times now they stay in the right rather than coming back to the middle. I think for them it begins with a different generational appeal, and that uh, whereas the Democrats are going young, the Republicans have gone old in last elections, guys in their 60s and mm -hmm. 70s. Mitt Romney is a rather youthful-looking 65, for example. It's hard to talk to voters when you're a grandpa. Okay. It's hard to relate to them on that, on that level. <laughs> Bill gets the last word. Bill Whalen, <laughs> Carla Marinucci, thanks so much for joining us, and thank you for being with us. And join us next time on The Game.